Joel chapter 2, verse 25. God speaking here. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. Verse 26. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. You will praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be put to shame. What a scripture this morning. Lord, bless the reading of your word. Change somebody's life today in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. God's people had turned, his, turned their backs on him. And so an invader had come in. And here's what God said. God said, as this invader has come in, don't worry about it because I'm going to restore to you the years. I'm so thankful he didn't say, I'll restore to you just yesterday or last week. No, God said, I'm going to restore to you years that the swarming locust has eaten. And here's going to be the result. You're going to eat in plenty. You will be satisfied. You will praise the name of the Lord your God who has dwelt wondrously with you. And my people will never be put to shame. I want to drop all the way down to the end of my message. And I want to give you my last three points and then I'm going to go into this sermon. Here's my last three points. Number one. God's going to give you your produce back. You're going to become productive again. Number two, God's going to give you your praise back. You're going to shout. You're going to rejoice. You're going to worship. You're going to, you're going to dance again. You're going to leap again. You're going to run again. You're going to praise again. And number three, God's going to give you presence back. See, when you go through a trial, it feels like God is distant from you. But when God restores, you're going to become productive again. You're going to become a praiser again, and you're going to be aware of his presence again. You're going to feel him walking right beside you. You're going to hear him speaking to you on a daily basis. Now, let me get into this sermon. It was, uh, I believe, 1992, and at Town Street, uh, Dad had called a revival for the church. Now, a revival back then meant you went to church not just a couple times on Sunday. No, you went Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And uh, we, I think it was a Monday night, if I'm not mistaken, a Monday or Tuesday night. We had been to church all night, and we got home. I was about 12 years old. We pull up to the garage, and Dad goes to let the garage up. Now, Dad was in the car, Mom, my sister, and myself. Well, the garage went up halfway and stopped. Dad put, put it down and lifted it up again. It went up halfway and it stopped. Now, he thought one of my baseball bats had fallen and it was blocking the garage door from going up. So he said, Eric, jump out, run under the garage, and move whatever it is that's keeping the door from going up. I run under the door and I looked around and there was nothing blocking the door, but the lock on the garage door had been pushed in. And it wasn't pushed in enough to keep the door from going up at all. The door was going up halfway and the lock was hitting and stopping the door. So I opened the lock and dad hit the button. The garage door went on up. I run to our garage door leading into our house. I turn the knob. I go in and I looked and the refrigerator door was open. And just past our refrigerator door was our uh, dining room, formal dining room, the dining room you eat in twice a year. There was that one. And the light was on very dim. And I remember the smell of smoke. It was a, a thick, like, uh, cigar, cigarette smoke. I can just, I can remember this so vividly in my mind. And I, I walked back out the garage door and I said, Dad, it smells like smoke in here. And just then my sister let out the most blood curdling scream you've ever heard. And she said, somebody ran past the door. We were being robbed. And I walked into the house while the robbers were still in the house. 
And my dad, I remember my dad turning around. I can remember him saying, Eric, run across the street, call the police. Back then, you know, uh, we didn't all carry, you know, like we do today. <laughs> Went Clint Eastwood on him. <laughs> so dad turns around and says, Eric, run across the street. So I jetted across the street. And sure enough, they were, they were still in the house. They ran to the patio door. They slid open the patio door and they ran out. And when... When the police got there, the police got there and they went in in front of us and they came out and they said, sure enough, you've been robbed. The refrigerator door opened, the dining room light low. They had come in, looked like through a window, went out the back patio door. The police brought the, 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 the dogs, tried to sniff out where they went. They couldn't find them. And I remember the police finally came out and said, the house is clear. You can come back inside. Now they had already fingerprinted and everything. And the, the thieves, the robbers, had made a tremendous mess. But if you've never dealt with fingerprint dust, that is a horrible, horrible mess. It was everywhere. And I can't, I, it's hard, unless you've been through this, it's hard to describe what it feels like to walk through your house knowing that somebody else had been in there, seeing their handprints on the window, seeing their handprints on your bedroom furniture, Seeing, knowing that this, this robber had come in and he had gone through your bedrooms and gone through your, 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 your places that you thought were safe. If there's one place that should be safe, it's your home. But we had been invaded. We had been invaded. And not only did they invade, but they destroyed while they were there. They, they broke things. They messed things up. And not only that, they took while they were there. Now we're left holding the remnants of this invasion because now not only have they stolen material things, they have stolen the intangible things. They have stolen peace. So now as a little boy, I got to go to sleep wondering, are they coming back through the window tonight? So now they've stolen our peace. They've stolen, uh, it wasn't a joyful night. It wasn't a joyful moment. And we, we had to live through this. And what began to happen is as days went on, you know, when you first walk back in, you go to your main things and sure enough, this is gone and this is gone and, and this is gone. But as the days went on, things that we had noticed, but then one day we need it and we go and look for it, it's gone. Well, where did it go? It was stolen weeks ago. It was stolen months ago. And we're just now coming to realize that when these robbers, when these thieves broke in our home, it wasn't just that day we noticed stuff missing. It was months down the road that we noticed this used to be here and it's not here anymore. And we would go and we would relive the night that we were robbed. Relive the night that I walked in and somebody else was in our home. These robbers are the same as locusts. Because all of us have moments in our life where locusts come into our life and we've been invaded, we've been broken, we've been stolen from, but most of all, we were violated. We were violated, not just material things, but the intangible things. Our peace was violated. Our joy was violated. Locusts come for three reasons. Sometimes locusts show up in our life because of sin. We invite the locust. When we are disobedient to God, when we don't live according to the word of God, we invite locusts into our life. We want to blame everybody else, but let's, let's be honest. There's a lot of things that we deal with. It was our fault. I can't blame you. Can't blame my parents. I made the decision. I made the decision to go there, do that, be with that person. It was my decision. The second thing that invites locust in is pride. Sometimes when we think we can do life without God, we get prideful. I got this under control. And then all of a sudden the locusts show up to show how much of control we really have. Pride is dangerous. It forces you to lie needlessly in a helpless state for days and sometimes years. See, some of you are putting up with locusts that you could have dealt with a long time ago, but your pride won't let you admit you got a locust. 
Now look, we're all coming over your house. We flip the light on. We see all the locusts scatter. You know what I'm talking about? We see all the locusts scatter. And you can say, oh, no, I've never seen that before. I've never seen, never seen them before. I saw four of them sitting over there singing, we are family. What are you talking about? Never seen them before. And so pride says, no, we don't have a problem. I know we could fix this. I know we could remedy it, but I'm not going to ask for help. See, you could have gotten up a long time ago. You could have went on with your life a long time ago, but pride wouldn't let you. And here's number three. Sometimes locusts come because of an enemy. You have an enemy. And it is not Jesus. He came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But the thief comes to steal. He came to kill. He came to destroy. So look at what Joel says here. He says, the swarming locust. The swarming locust, whenever you read about swarming locust in the Bible, it is talking about a day, a time, or a season of devastation. A day, a time, or a season of devastation. And there are people in this room today that have been through a day of devastation. Some of you a time, but there are some of you in this room, you've been in a season of devastation. The only problem is your seasons don't last three months. Some of you have been in a season for years, years and years of devastation. When these locusts come in, they strip vegetation. They are assigned and they are designed to look for life, greenery, and they strip anything they find of its identity. They find something that was thriving and they strip it, causing it to look like it was dead. The reason the locust targeted you is because you were alive. They wouldn't have messed with you if you were dead. They came because something was thriving in your life. Something was producing in your life. Something was growing in your life. Something was multiplying in your life. And the locust saw, that's a good spot right there. That's a good person right there. Let's go. That's life right there. And they stripped you down until you look like you're dead. You used to be the most exciting person in church. But you've lost your joy. You've lost your peace. You've lost your hope. Now let's look at these different levels of locust development. The first one he talks about is the crawling locust. The crawling locust is, this is the developmental stages that a locust goes through before it becomes a full adult locust. The crawling locust is the creeping stage. It has no wings. It is the beginning of destruction. Let me tell you the sign of crawling locust. Crawling locusts frustrate you because you can't really see them because they're so small. They don't have wings, so they're not flying around. They hide and they tuck up under things and you just, you know something's wrong. You just can't put your finger on it. It's a season of frustration. It's a season of being upset and you don't know what you're upset about. You're in a, you're in a, a state of disease but you don't know what's causing the disease in your life here's my here's the big idea about this stage don't ignore this stage the holy spirit is a spirit of peace he is the voice of peace the peace of god guards your mind and heart through christ jesus so if something is robbing you of your peace, it's not from God. Don't just go to sleep and say, it'll go away. It'll work itself out. Nope. If it is stealing your peace, deal with it now. It doesn't, listen, it doesn't get better because you ignore it. It doesn't get better because you're a nice person. It doesn't get better because you want to play by it. That's not why it gets better. It, 
You want to know when it gets better? When you go on the offense, when you go on the attack. I'm tired of whatever this is stealing my peace. That's the crawling locust. The second stage is the chewing locust. It's a, it's a, a gnawing beast. It doesn't devour the crop. It just pokes holes in it and it affects it. See, the chewing locust isn't divorce. It's just the marriage isn't what it used to be. You're living together, but you don't like each other. You're roommates. You're not husband and wife. Divorce is on the way. When the locusts show up, divorce is on the way. If you don't deal with the chewing locust right now. When the husband takes on another hobby and another hobby and another hobby and another hobby and he joins 15 softball teams so he doesn't have to come home at night, it's not because he's got a dream of being a professional softballer. It's because there's a chewing locust in that marriage you better deal with. Let me tell you something about my wife. She makes me want to come home at night. I don't dread going home to that. I don't know where your all minds went. She's a good cook. Well, you all, look, get your mind out of the gutter. Good Lord. She's a good cook. She makes me want to come home because I'm hungry. And I know when I sit down, it's going to be a good meal. It's going... But when you, when you are, I don't under, look, look, to each his own. I don't understand couples who don't want to be around each other. There's not a person in this world that I'd rather travel with than that lady right there. There's not a person in this world that I would rather go to the grocery store with than that person right there. There's not a person in this world that I'd rather go to Home Depot with than that woman right there. There's not a place I would rather be than except in her presence right there. I enjoy my wife. And if there ever comes a day that I don't want to go home, if there ever comes a day when I don't want to be around her, it's because I've let a chewing locust start affecting. It's not divorce, but it's heading that direction. It's wasting it. Here's what one, uh, uh, one biologist talked about these locusts. It said it chews up vegetation and it doesn't even eat what it chews. It's like a person who gets a plate of food and decide they don't want it anymore and they throw it away in the garbage. That's what chewing locust does. They don't even devour, they just chew it up and spit it out and, and you have to deal with the waste. Here's number th three, the consuming locust. Now destruction is increasing. The destruction is moving, it's accelerating, it's getting faster. Why? Because this locust, because you've let it live, because you've let it survive in your presence, in your home, in your family, it's getting more and more hungry. It's eating and eating and consuming and consuming. Why is it consuming so much? Because it's about to transform into something bigger. So it starts eating, 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 but it's not just satisfied with this. It starts eating over here too. And then it starts eating over here and then it starts chewing on this and then it starts devouring this. So what was one problem in this area has now become multiple problems in multiple areas. So it was just something going on in your marriage, but now it's in your marriage and now it's in your kids and, and now it's showing up in your finances and now it's showing up in your prayer life and now it's showing up in your church life and now it's showing up in, in, in this part of your life and now you don't want to go to work in the morning and now you're about to lose your job. Why? Because all these locusts have come in and they're getting hungrier and hungrier. They have one goal, to steal, to kill, and destroy anything connected to you that looks like life. They're there to cause devastation, to cause severe or widespread damage to anything. And then he says this, and I thought this was interesting. He says, great army, great army, sin among you. Now, the definition of this is, and listen, it is those strong for war. Those strong for war. This is when the enemy starts tapping people on the shoulder 
to start coming in and destroy your life. Now before, you can have things going on and it's not even, it's not even coming from an outside source. But then the enemy will assign a person who is strong for war. All of us will go to war if we have to, but hopefully you aren't strong for war. When you're strong for war, you wake up with war on your mind. You wake up with hate on your mind. You wake up with destruction on your mind. And there are people, thank God there's not a lot of them, but there are people who all they do is love war. They can't be satisfied if they're not fighting somebody else. Their life is the destruction. And let me tell you something about these people. They will not apologize. Don't ever think that, you know what, one day they'll come to their senses and they'll apologize for all the harm they've done. It will never happen because they're, they're bent towards war. They're strong towards war. They don't care what they do to you. They don't care what they say about you. These are people who will say anything about you regardless of the consequences after they say it. They don't care. They'll say it on social media. They'll, they'll write, they'll, they'll talk, they'll spread, they'll do whatever they gotta do. Why? They're strong for war. And there are people in this room right now who are in the dating stage of your relationship. And you are dating somebody who all they wanna do is fight as your pastor. Can I give you one word of advice? Run as fast as you can. Don't think when you marry them, they're gonna get nicer. No, they're showing you everything you need to see right now while you're dating. Run away, get away from them. I promise you somebody's gonna remember that when they're, when they're married. And they'll be like, pastor told me. So look what we got, swarming, crawling, chewing, consuming, a great army of locusts strong for war. What am I gonna do? How can I handle this? They're coming at me from every direction. Oh, isn't it good that we have a promise? And here's the promise. I will restore to you. That's a word for somebody today. I God Almighty will restore to you. What's it mean when God restores? When we say restore, what do we talk about? When you restore a car, what do you do? You, you take this car that's been brokeaged and broken and damaged and, and that's, that's been affected by time and been affected by the elements around it and it's been affected by neglect. You take this car and what do you do? You bring it back to its original state. That's what we talk about when we talk about restore. That's not what your God talks about. Because when God restores something, he makes it better than it ever was. He's not bringing you back to who you used to be. He's bringing you back not only to who you used to be, but now you're a person who has the wisdom and experience of everything you've just been through. And now you got a deeper level of faith than you had before you went through it. When God gets done restoring you, you will be better than you ever dreamed possible. In 2006, a, a man who owns hotels in Las Vegas, Steve Wynn, he's also an avid art collector. And he had this very, very expensive piece of art. In fact, uh, another, another investor in art had agreed to buy this Picasso from Wynn for $139 million. So when, when he came up to Wynn's uh, 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 apartment, I guess you would say in the hotel there, Wynn was showing it to him. And he turned and as he did, he put his elbow through the canvas of this $139 million piece of, a, piece of art. I want you to think about this for a second. I don't, I don't know how sick you would have been, but. Now, it was scheduled to be sold in just a matter of days. And of course, he had to say, I, I release you from the sale. I release you from the contract. One person looked at it and they said, with, with this amount of damage, this $139 million painting is only going to be worth $89 million after it's repaired. Only $89 million after it's repaired. $85 million. 
But guess what? When the restore got done, they did such a good job that just over six years later, the same investor showed up. Now the painting had now been told 85 million. They had a deal at 139 million, but the investor said, no, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 155 million, 16 million more than my original offer. Because after the damage, the painting's now worth more. After the restoration, the painting's now worth more. And that's a word for somebody in this room today. When God gets done with you, you are go you're not going to be worth less. You're not coming out of this broke down, busted, and disgusted. You're not coming down messed up. You're not coming out of this uh, 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 living with all the pain of the past. No, honey, when God gets done with you, you're going to be worth more than you ever dreamed possible. God's not just taking you back to the original. Original. He's making you better than you ever were. If somebody receives that word, give Jesus a big praise. Let me show you what happens when God gets involved. Exodus 22 verse 1. If a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he must restore five oxen for an ox, four sheep for a sheep. You hear what God's saying? You don't just, when the enemy is found, you don't just put back what you took. You better multiply it and put it back in their life. That's what I'm preaching over somebody today. Keep your expectancy up. Your destination is restoration. And the devil's not just going to give you back the day he took. He's got to add to the days he took and put them back. He's not just going to give you back the year he took. He's got to go back and take years and put years back onto your life that he tried to steal your joy, steal your peace, Feel your rest. It's coming back. Your destination is restoration. Look at somebody and tell them your destination is restoration. I'm going to be better than I ever was. It doesn't matter what was lost when God restores it. It's going to be better. You got word for this? Go back to Joel 2. You'll eat in plenty. This word plenty here means lay claim to the space you lost. Lay claim to the space you lost. Lay claim to the territory that the enemy invaded and he started living on it. He took it from you. But when God shows up, you're going to start laying claim. Give me healing back. Give me peace back. Give me my children back. Give me my health back. Give me every dollar, devil, you laid your hands on. But not just that. When the thief is found, he must restore seven times everything that he put his I'm declaring today my destination is restoration. Somebody praise God if I'm preaching to you in this house here at Forest Park, at Lebanon, wherever you're watching. You will be satisfied. Somebody shout satisfied. satisfied. Say plenty. Plenty. I'm taking claim of all the space that I lost. Every bit of territory. Say satisfied. Do you know what this word means? Joy. Filled with presence and you have too much. Joy. Filled with presence, not gifts, presence. The presence, remember what I told you was coming back? Produce, praise, presence. Produce, praise, what you produce is coming back. Praise is coming back. Presence, the presence of God is coming back. And where, what did the Bible say? Oh Lord, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. When the presence of God comes back, depression has to leave, anxiety has to leave. Fear has to leave, worry has to leave, tension has to leave, stress has to leave. When he shows up, there is joy overflowing and full of glory. It is joy in the Holy Ghost. Somebody say, my joy, my joy, my joy is coming back today. Give Jesus a big prayer. I'm preaching better than you're shouting this morning.
shall plenty shall satisfy shout restore restore you know what that means to be completed something showed up and has left you feeling like you are incomplete your journey was incomplete your dreams are incomplete your purpose is incomplete but God said when I start this this when I put you to this destination of restoration you are going to be completed and watch this here's what it means I looked it up to be in a covenant of peace in a covenant of peace when you enter into a covenant with somebody, what it means is they will now show up to help you fight your battles. When I get into a covenant with God, God shows up to fight my battles. I don't have to fight them. I'm in a covenant with God. He's got the army. He's got the military. He's got the angels. They show up to fight my battles. Well, guess what? When God restores, you get in a covenant of peace. And whenever something shows up to steal your peace, God dispatches angels and says, move that. Move that out of their life. Move that stress. Move that fear. Move that anxiety. I got a covenant of peace with them. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in this room. Take 10 seconds and give Jesus a big praise. Hallelujah. I got to hurry. You will not be ashamed. You will not be ashamed. That word ashamed, watch this. You will look backward and you will look forward and you will not be disgraced. He's restoring to you years. Yeah. Some of y'all done some stuff. And if we told people what you did, you'd be ashamed. But God said when restoration shows up, you'll look back at your past. You'll look forward to your future, but you will not be disgraced. You will not be shamed. Because God said, I'm making you complete. I'm restoring what the enemy took from you in your child years. I'm restoring what the enemy took from you in your teenage years. I'm restoring what the enemy took from you in your 20s. I'm restoring what the enemy took from you in your 30s. I'm restoring what the enemy did to you in your 40s. I'm restoring what the enemy tried to do to you in your 50s. I'm restoring what the enemy tried to steal from you in your 60s. And you're going to look back and you're going to look forward, but you will not be disgraced because I've made you complete. I've made you whole, nothing missing, nothing broken. Whatever the enemy took, he had to put it back. But not just that, he had to add to everything. He... I'm about to shout out of this suit this morning. I need somebody to catch in the spirit what it is that the Holy Ghost is preaching to you this morning. Put it back, put it back, put it back. Every sleepless night, put it back. Every holiday interrupted, put it back. Every dollar I had to spend on medicine, put it back. Every dollar I had to spend on a psychiatrist, put it back, put it back, put it back. Better, 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 better. I don't want what you took. I want better. I want more. I want you to add to it and put it back. Somebody give Jesus a big praise. Don't you know what you did? Who you talking about? God put those years back. Is that even possible? My God controls time. My God created time. And you're trying to tell me he can't add back years that the enemy took from me? God can put it back. Shout my destination is restoration. 
My destination is restoration. My destination is restoration. You got children living in sin right now. Start declaring my destination. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Lord, you gave me a promise that if I would follow your word, then I would be blessed in my children and my children's children down to the thousand generation. But God, the enemy's trying to step in and he's trying to take my children from me. But God, I'm declaring destination is restoration. Devil, put it back. It's gonna get crazy in here. It's 1047, I'm watching the time. It's about to get crazy, but high five five people and just declare, let the restoration begin. Let the restoration begin. Let the ration, let the restor, you know somebody that's been sick, high five them and tell them, let the restoration begin. Let the healing begin. Let the healing begin. Let the healing begin. Let the healing begin. Let the financial return turnaround begin. Let the joy begin today. Let the peace begin today. Let the faith begin today. Oh, we praise you, God. people let the restoration begin let the restoration begin over Peggy's life let the restoration begin I know you all don't know Peggy I grew up with Peggy I watched her walk through hell and come into church shouting after she had been through hell all week long let the restoration begin in her life. Let the restoration begin in your life. Let the restoration begin in your family. Let the restoration begin in your home. I will restore to you, says the Lord. I will restore to you, says the Lord. Hallelujah. I'll take yours if you got it. Thank you, Elder. Come on, I told you I'm preaching to your expectancy. And I need you to start declaring right now, my destination is restoration. My destination is restoration. My destination, my destination, my destination. You need a touch from God, get down here right now. You need a touch of the Holy Ghost. Get down here right now. You're believing for God to restore something. Get down here, come on. We're gonna pray.
a breakthrough. There's a breakthrough. There's a healing that's got somebody's name on it today. There's a breakthrough that's got somebody's name on it today. There's a restoration that's got somebody's name on it today. Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 17 for I will restore health to you and your wounds I will heal declares the Lord I will restore health to you and your wounds I will heal declares the Lord who needs a healing lift your hands and say my destination is restoration I declare healing right now I declare a restoration of healing right now. I declare a restoration of healing right now. A restoration of healing right now. A restoration of healing right now. And if there was something you couldn't do when you walked in this place, bend your back, bend your knees, I dare you just to take a step of faith and start trying it because restoration is in the room right now. Wounds are being healed. Wounds are being healed. Listen to this, Psalms chapter 51 verse 12, David prays, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Do you hear what he's saying? That's the joy you had the first day you got saved. But you got busy doing church. You got so busy having church that you forgot why you came to church. It was to be in his presence because in his presence there's fullness of joy but some of you need to pray God take me back take me back to the joy I had the first day I got saved the first day you filled me with the Holy Ghost listen to this right here's where the faith comes in Job 42 10 and the Lord somebody say the Lord restored say the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. Now hold on. That's a bad translation. These were the people who showed up that blamed Job for the condition he was in. We call them Job's comforters. They're not very much friends. But when he prayed for them, God restored the fortunes. It doesn't stop there. And the Lord, say the Lord, gave Job, because this is what happens anytime God gets involved, twice as much as he had before. Twice as much, double, 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 double. I don't know who you need to forgive, but forgive him right now, because double. I don't know who you need to bless, but bless him right now, double. I don't know who you need to pray for, but pray for him right now. But they hurt me, pray for him. Forgive him, bless him. Cause double, double, double is coming back to me. We give you all 
the glory we worship you our lord you are worthy to be praised sing it again we God's going to give you your produce back. You say produce. He's going to make you productive. See, when the locust showed up, you stopped. You stopped dreaming. You stopped moving forward. You stopped advancing. All your dreams came to a halt. All your visions stopped right there. But God said, I'm going to make you productive again. You're going to start moving forward. I'm going to give you your praise back. How many of you, when you came down to this altar, have a praise you didn't have when you came down to this altar? You got it back. That's God giving you praise back. And do you know why praise comes back? Because presence is back. You feel him. You feel his hand on your life. You feel he's speaking to you again. Get ready. Some of you are going to go home tonight and you're going to hear God start speaking to you about your dream again and your vision again and about your children again and about your future again. Come on, sing it. We give. This is not your end. Sing it again. You're gonna move forward. We give, we give you all the glory. We worship, we worship you, our Lord. Can we sing it one more time? I want everybody to open your mouth. Let's lift our hands in this place. God is. In this place. 